Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Gordy here, and in this video, I'm going to jump into the best cell of the brain, the microglia. It is a little micro uh, innate immune cell of the brain, and it has some amazing and perhaps surprising functions that are really unique to microglia compared to their peripheral equivalent, the macrophage. So let's have a look here um, at one. Oh, cool. And I made this image, so I'm super proud of it, obviously. And um, this is immunohistochemistry stain. Um, and so we can see these fluorescent recent uh, objects in the image and in red we have microglia um, and in green we have a protein aggregate this is something you don't want in the brain uh, an aggregated protein uh, you want your proteins to be nice and soluble and constantly recycled this is an insoluble uh, fibula aggregate of protein and in blue we have nuclei so that's just telling us where some cells are so we can see that the microglia have a green have a blue nuclei but there's also other cells out here that might be neurons or astrocytes um, and what we can see is that the red microglia are eating the green protein aggregate and it's going inside the phagolysosome and so we can see these small phagolysosomes that are yellow because green plus red makes yellow in fluorescent microscopy. So we can see these yellow uh, phagolysosomes in these microglia. Very, very cool. So that hints at one of the major functions of the microglia, which is phagocytosis. They eat uh, protein aggregates, they eat pathogens, and they also eat dysfunctional and dying neurons and also unnecessary neuronal connections which are called synapses so let's jump into that first of all here we have some quote-unquote resting microglia so this is what microglia normally look like in the brain now this has been taken live in a mouse brain um, it's using this technique this really really cool technique where we make a cranial window but under anesthesia we drill a hole and we fill it full of a transparent gel and then we can look into the brain using a two photon fluorescent microscopy where most microscopy the laser um, comes from a single source and activates the fluorophore the fluorescent antibody or the fluorescent protein and two photon uh, microscopy two photons are required to induce fluorescence and so you can imagine you can change the depth of what's fluorescing by changing your two photon the focus of your two photons right so we can actually look deep into the into the brain because the two photons could come from here and excite this fluorophore which is actually deep below the surface of the brain so two photon microscopy allows us to look much deeper into the tissue so here we're looking at microglia and a healthy brain and a living mouse and we can see that they're not still they're resting but they are not still they have very long processes and these processes are constantly crawling around to survey the extracellular environment and they're just checking that everything is going on and look how much they are moving isn't that brilliant now in the next video um, they're going to be white um, rather than green and uh, they're going to induce an injury in the middle of the image using a laser so they're going to essentially burn a small hole in the tissue and we can watch what happens to the microglia so the hole's right in the middle there. So we'll watch that again. In white, we have the microglia. So these are the microglia here. And look at what their processes are doing. Isn't that awesome? They're just zooming in. They've, they've sensed some uh, uh, damage-associated molecular patterns that are being released from the site of injury. And the microglial processes are crawling up the concentration gradient towards that damaged tissue to surround it. They will then now start to phagocytose some of the damaged tissue. And in fact, they'll normally drag their whole body there eventually. So they'll send their processes there, and then they will fully crawl up to the site of damage, um, where they can now start phagocytosing up those potentially damaging compounds. So if, if a cell explodes, it's releasing damaging stuff. There's a lot of stuff inside a cell that we do not want outside of a cell. And so that's what the microglia are doing. They're cleaning up the, that damage, damaging molecule that have now been released from inside the cell to outside the cell. Um, so uh, this is again using that same technique, except over there are a few days. So it doesn't have to be as dramatic as um, a laser injury or anything like that. Sometimes a neuron can become unnecessary. Perhaps it loses a lot of its connection, so now it's not really functional. Um, or perhaps its job is redundant, or perhaps it's exhausted and it's ready to die. Perhaps a mutation has occurred that's made it not functional. So then a microglia needs to identify a dysfunctional single neuron and take it out. And that's what we're seeing here. So here's a green neuron and a red microglia. And the red microglia is heading towards that green neuron by day 
four, it's on top of the green neuron. And by day six, the neuron's gone. The microglia is recognized that this neuron's in trouble, crawled over to it, and consumed it, essentially, eaten it. And that's another key function. So how does a microglia identify a dysfunctional neuron? Now, I've got a picture of a membrane up here, and that's a clue, right? Because what we can think, if we think about it for a little while, we can think that it's unlikely that all the signaling is occurring through some sort of secreted molecule. So the neuron probably isn't secreting something, and that's the be-all and end-all of its signaling to the microglia that I needed to be eaten. Why can we assume that? Well, neurons are often very tightly packed in together, and secreting is an inaccurate, um, an inaccurate way to communicate. So if, I, if I'm a neuron and I'm here and I'm secreting a signal that says I need to be consumed, and there's another neuron right here, he, that they might be thinking, please don't do that, because I'm going to get eaten, right? And so um, that does happen. They do release a secretory thing, but that just tells the microglia to come close. Then we need something a bit more locational in order to really communicate to the neuron, it's me and not this guy. It's this guy, not this guy that needs to get eaten. And that communication actually happens at the membrane. So here we have a phospholipid membrane, hopefully you guys all remember this. It's got a phosphate group at the top, which is polar, therefore it's attracted to water. And it's got lipid tails, which are non-polar. It's like an oil, doesn't like water, so it likes other oils. So what ends up happening is the uh, phosphate groups end up all facing into the water, and the lipid tails all face in towards each other, and that forms a membrane. Now you can just chuck phospholipids into water, and this is one of the structures they will spontaneously form. Now, whenever we see a diagram, they're normally shown as uniform. A phospholipid is a phospholipid, but that's not true. Um, so we're going to jump into some of the special phospholipids and how these phospholipids can communicate um, to microglia. And they contain two of the best named enzymes in the human body. I maintain that they are the best. If you have a different opinion, please comment below. I'd love to hear what's a better enzyme name. Okay, so this is actually what a membrane looks like. You can see, first of all, it's very dysfunctional. Second of all, it's all moving incredibly rapidly. These lipids will flip to over to there and flip back spontaneously. Um, that can also be enzyme facilitated, which we're about to learn about. But also they're moving within the, um, they're moving within the membrane at about the speed of Usain Bolt at about 10 meters per second, which is crazy when you think about a cell, right? They are rapidly moving. Um, and you can see here, we've got a lot of green down here, a lot of red up there, blue up there, not a lot of blue down there. They're not homogeneously distributed. They're not homogeneous. There are different kinds of phospholipids, and they're not evenly distributed on the inside and the outside. There is something different about those phospholipids between the inside and the outside. So as with all biology, everything's more complicated than the textbook diagrams that we normally see. This is where the enzymes come in. The two greatest named enzymes uh, in the human body, there's flipase and flopase. There's another one called scramblase, but we don't need to go into that right now. We're just going to go into these flippase and floppase. And what flippase and floppase do is they shift one kind of phospholipid uh, down and the floppase flips another kind of phospholipid out. So down here, this is inside the cell. This is outside the cell. And flippase flips a phosphatidyl serine from out here down into there. So phosphatidylserine is a special phospholipid and it's predominantly on the inside leaf of the cell membranes and that's because of this enzyme which flips it down into the cell. Flopase flips phosphatidylcholine outside the cell. Um, and so these actually have little, um, these are called amino phospholipids because they have a little amino acid like uh, thing there that are just amino group that flips in that makes them a special uh phospholipid sorry so there's a phosphatidyl uh, serine and there's a phosphatidyl choline and this process requires atp so this hints at some automatic features of these enzymes so these processes consume energy in order to maintain the uh different compositions of phospholipids on the inner leaf of the uh, cell membrane and on the outer leaf of the cell membrane. So what happens, 
we end up with this build up of phosphatidyl serine over time on the inside and a build up of phosphatidyl choline on the outside over time. So that's the resting state of a healthy cell. There's lots of PS on the inside, we always just call it PS, and a lot of PC on the outside there. Now, what happens when we don't have any ATP? Say a cell is dying and it's mitochondria are dysfunctional, it's got not enough glucose maybe, maybe not enough oxygen, so it cannot generate ATP in order to maintain the flippase activity. But what happens is the um, the the phosphatidyl serine will now become evenly distributed across the outer membrane and the inner membrane. So now, uh, now instead of having only phosphatidyl serine, predominantly phosphatidyl serine on the inner leaf, it's now popping out to the outer leaf and we end up with an even distribution of phosphatidyl serine. So this is what happens when we've run out of ATP. Now, this can be used as a signal, a very local signal to the microglia, this cell doesn't have ATP. Therefore, there is something wrong with the cell. Therefore, we need to eat it. So how do we get from phosphatidyl serine facing outwards into a consumed cell? Well, we actually need some molecules to recognize that phosphatidyl serine and to bind to receptors on the microglia and induce phagocytosis. And this is actually where the complement proteins come in. Now, this is quite interesting. So um, complement proteins are normally, we find them in our plasma, but our brain has a blood-brain barrier, so we don't normally get the cells of our immune system or the proteins of our blood inside our brain. But there are cells at the site, such as microglia, pumping out complement proteins into the cerebral spinal fluid. And so we have complement protein 1Q, heaps of it, we've got truckloads of it being produced by microglia and it is floating around our cerebral spinal fluid. Now this complement 1, uh, this C1 complement protein binds to phosphatidyl serine. Oh, I've got some unnecessary animations. Um, now, the C1 uh, complement protein recruits the C3 complement protein. That binds to the uh, complement receptor protein 3 on the microglia. And so the microglia can now come along, sort of essentially latch onto the complement 3, which has been recruited there by the complement 1, and it can eat. And in this case, it's eating a synapse. But that can go so far as to eating a neuron. Now, there are as an important thing to know, it's not just a lack of ATP that will induce uh, the flippase and floppase to stop working. Uh, there are pro direct processes within the body that can cause the flippase and floppase to stop working, including um, enzymes that are associated with apoptosis. So when we want to induce apoptosis, we often activate enzymes. Often these enzymes called caspases, um, sometimes calpanes as well. So we activate these enzymes and these enzymes essentially digest the flippase and floppase. So they stop working and then we end up with the phosphatidyl serine flipping out and facing outside. Um, but here we have some sort of dysfunctional synapse and there's Dysfunction in the synapse, which is triggering the phosphatidyl serine to flip out, which now can be recognized by the complement 1Q protein, which is then recruits the complement 3 protein, which then causes phagocytosis. Now, all of this has really important roles in how the immune system can become damaging in the case of things like stroke and dementia, when some of these processes can become a little bit overhyped. Now, microglia, of course, do all the other immune cell stuff as well. So they've got loads of pattern recognition receptors like toll-like receptors or nod receptors um, or um, RLRs, complement receptors. I just mentioned one, scavenger receptors. And this one here, TREM2, that's very interesting because if you have a mutation in that, your risk of Alzheimer's disease goes up. So um, all of these receptors are very important. But that is to say it, it does also have, despite having these really unique unique functions of synaptic pruning, for example, it also has a lot of the generic innate immune functions that we would see in a macrophage, such as patient pattern recognition receptors. Now, I don't want you to learn all of these, but it is it should be in your vocabulary, the ones I've got an arrow beside, which is the complement receptor. I just I just talked about one, which was essential for synaptic phagocytosis. Toll-like receptors and nod-like receptors are just absolutely ubiquitous 
through immunology. So it is really important you understand those terms. And as we go on to try to understand Alzheimer's disease, it is really important that you understand those receptors. And I mentioned this TREM2 down here, which is critical in Alzheimer's disease. So we'll probably talk about that one later on in another video. So um, that, those are important to understand. And of course, it can release cytokines, all the cytokines you can imagine in order to modulate the immune response. Now, some of these, um, say, for example, um, interferon and IL-12, these modulate the adaptive immune system largely. They're, they're mostly targeted at the adaptive immune system. They do have functions in innate immune cells as well as just regular parenchymal cells. But they, they can be thought of as an adaptive immune cytokine. Um, and also these innate immune cytokines like IL-1. Um, TNF is also quite adaptive immune system as well. But the one I really want you to focus on because we're really going to do a deep dive in this one later is interleukin-1 beta. Uh, microglia and interleukin-1 beta, ooh, that is a juicy story. And so I'm going to be jumping into that super deep later on. So microglia, they're phagocytes, they eat pathogens, dying cells, um, and they also curate the brain architecture by uh, eating synapses. And they also do surveillance with pattern recognition receptors and release cytokines to regulate the immune response. Next up, we're going to cover, is the brain immune privileged? And what do we mean by it? You probably will hear this term that the brain is immune privileged. So I'm going to jump into that a little bit more in the next video.